My name is Jeremy Akiola and I'm the Dean of um, School of Parenting. So you're welcome once again to this special, special program today. We call it Parenting 101, from diapers to diploma. Now, this is a very, very special course uh, that we have put together and it's going to um, go through the whole phases of parenting. So we, we know that parenting, that raising children is a, is a God-given responsibility. Bible says in um, Proverbs 22, 6, we should train up a child in the way he should go. And when he is old, he will not depart from it. We believe that parenting must be deliberate and very, very intentional. And we don't want to just do product testing, especially with our first child. Um, the story is being told. I don't know, some of us may have heard this kind of story or even experienced it, where a, a newlywed couple um, got their, uh, by, by the blessings of God, they were able to have their first child. Then when that child uh, started growing up, started working, the child then decided to throw tantrums. And the parents were all over, just cajoling him, uh, begging him, pacifying him one way or the other. And the child is just not responding. They even calling their grandparents, calling the doctors, please, what would you do? How can we do? How can you help us? You know, they were just so worried. And then um, after, after they've been told and advised by various people, oh, the child is just play, uh, playing up to their tantrums they will get over it after a while. The parents were so worried. Then a few years down the lines, they've had their first child, second child, third child, fourth child. By the time that fourth child is throwing up tantrums, guess what these parents were doing? They said, oh, just leave him. He will, he will be okay. <laughs> you know, so by this time now they've grown. <laughs> so please let, we, we don't want to get into that stage of um, doing testing, shouting and doing all those things on our first child. And then by the time he's getting to the third child, we are relaxed, we are not deliberate, we are not intentional anymore. So please, this is very important. We have to be deliberate and intentional all through. Now, so for this program today, uh, we therefore invite you to come and join us and learn from our team of very experienced parents. Dr. Ronke Akiola is a pediatrician, pediatric endocrinologist, and senior lecturer of pediatrics, partner, Parenting Matters Ventures, faculty member, School of Parenting, Daystar Christian Center, sub-dean, faculty of clinical sciences, Lagos State University College of Medicine, pediatrician at Jamia Medical Center, co-author of two parenting books, Baba, Our Young Old Man, and What My Children Need to Know Before They Leave Home. She lives in Lagos with her her husband and children. So we do know that raising children is a huge responsibility. In the School of Parenting, we believe that raising children is a God-given responsibility and one that we must take very seriously. After all, children are not born with manuals. And while it is true that it takes a whole village, it takes many people to raise a child, we also believe that the first instructors, the first teachers of a child are the parents. And so the things that the parents enforce, they have most influence over the children. And so the things that they enforce stay with the children for a long time. So as far as we are concerned, uh, parents are the first teachers of uh, the children. Parents also have the unique responsibility and the unique, they, they're in such a position that they can mold the character of the child. Now, we are talking in this session about children aged 10 to 17. And this, is, this falls within the age group where we refer to as adolescence. It is a period of transitioning for the child. The child is transitioning from being a child to being a full-grown adult. And in that period, many things are going on. The child is trying to discover his own identity. So for so long, he's been hearing mommy say this and daddy say that. But now he wants to know, what do I believe? He wants to be able to take ownership, to be able to take responsibility for his beliefs. And because of all of this, it's also an age where, um, you know, the children, the adolescents, they are prone to peer influence, the influence of their friends. 
And so, so many things are going on around them. And as many of us know, because we have been there before, we do know that adolescence can be a rocky period in the life of a child. So in this session, we discuss some areas of importance in the lives of our preteens and our teenagers. We talk, let's talk first about faith. Faith is very important and faith really is what do our children, what do the children at this age, what do they profess, what do they believe? The Bible says that we should train up a child in the way that he should go and when he is grown it will be difficult for him to depart from that path. So training up a child, we have started even before the age of 10 and what we want to do in this period is to reinforce those training. So at this point it's no longer time to say, um, to, to keep asking them to do this or to do that. Now the roles have shifted from just asking them to do, and at this point in time, we have, for more than um, being just instructors, we have transited into being cheerleaders and into being coaches. And so we should help them to realize that they can call to God and he will answer them, you know, and show them things in their own lives as he does in our own life. So what we want them to be able to do at this stage is to be able to call on God as my God, to be able to personalize, you know, their relationship is about their relationship with God now. It's about what their relationship with God is. So we don't just want them to be able to say um, the God of Abraham, the God of Jacob, the God of Isaac, or the God of my father and my mother. We want them to go beyond that. We want them to be able to say my God. We want them to be able to call on him knowing that he will answer. After all, the Bible says that God rewards those that diligently seek him. These are things that they should know, they, to, they should know by themselves at this age. And it's about relationship. So at this point, we, we have trained them this far, and so we continue to guide them in their relationship with their father. Children need to also see parents living this faith that we profess. So it's not about asking them to do, it's about showing them. When we show them, when they see us living our faith um, on a day-to-day -day basis, then it becomes easy and it becomes natural for them to also live out their faith. Um, many people say that a family that prays together stays together. That's because through thick and thin, the family prays, they pray about um, easy situations, they pray about difficult ones, they don't take things for granted, and they are thankful, so they live out their faith on a day-to-day -day basis. Beyond praying together as a family, we should pray as parents now, we should pray for each child. And praying doesn't always have to be in a formal setting. It can be the child that is going out, and we just hug the child and say, oh, as you go today, um, God guides your step. Or for that child that has exams, and we speak a word as the child is going and say that your memory is blessed. All the things that you have read, the um, God's spirit brings them to your remembrance. It's to say things like, you have an excellent spirit. It's to say things like, your light shines and your light will continue to shine. We are speaking, you know, scripture into their lives. We are actually praying for them. And the more they hear us do that, then they also imbibe that into them. Then we don't, we're not advocating that our children see us parents as um, being um, without fault. It is far from it. So we should share our challenges. Share with them that period when you know that exam that you were sitting for and then you had to do it three times before eventually you pass the fourth time. It's part of the challenges of life. Share it with them. What was it that made you pass the fourth time? Was it that you prayed a little bit differently? Or was it that you waited on God such that you had a specific scripture and you knew without a shadow of doubt that that particular exam, you will pass it without doubt? If that's your experience, share it with them because they will also have their own unique experiences, but they can learn from the experiences of their parents. So it's not all about, you know, having done all well. The things that have gone on very well, let us share with them to encourage them. The things that have not gone on so well, let us also share and encourage them. I remember, for example, um, I think it was my first professional exam and I failed it, you know, and I was thinking, what is my father going to say? Ah, my father is going to be so disappointed and all that. 
I wasn't thinking about myself. But then I got home and I told my dad, oh, this was my result, I failed. And he put his hands in his, uh, uh, you know, his head in his hands. And I thought, oh goodness, this guy is disappointed. So I asked, daddy, are you disappointed in me? And he said, no child, I'm not disappointed in you. It's just that I also failed this particular exam and it was a rough time for me. And so I just want you to be able to, you know, overcome uh, with, uh, with um, easier, you know, than, than I had it. And so, you know, that was sharing a challenge with a child. And you can imagine what that did to the child in question. So, so share everything. Share the experiences, the learning points. Share the good, share the not so good, share the bad, and share the ugly. Let them see things, you know, as they are. Be real, yes, that's it. Be real, be authentic with the children. And help them, these adolescents, um, to know that following after God and serving God is, is, a, is, a, is a lifetime, you know. It's a journey, it's a journey, it's a journey. Values. Values are important. And the truth is that the faith that we profess guides our values. Someone said that when you're a Christian, you really don't have to tell people that you're a Christian. People should be able to see from your character. People should be able to see by the values that you live by. People should be able to see on, you know, going by the decisions, the quality of the decisions that you take day by day that you're a Christian. And that's what we want for our children. We want them to have self-control. We want them to be able to forgive. We want them to have that spirit of humility and gentleness. We want them to be able to respect the next person. So we want them to have um, these beliefs that they hold on to, those beliefs that in the face of uh, peer pressure and all of that, they own uh, by themselves. So these are all godly values. And there are many more of such values. Now, they, have, they are becoming of age. And um, at this age, you no longer say, oh, leave leave her alone or leave him alone, he's just a child. No, at that point, and maybe even before now, what they communicate, what they say, we hold them to their words. So we need to model to them and teach them how to communicate. You know, communication is an art and it can, it can, it can be learned. Yes, communication can be learned. Also, we need to realize that communication is a two-way street. So it's not just a one-way. I hear some parents say, you know, that child has not called me for the older children that, you know, are away. And they say, that child has not called me, and I'm waiting for that child to call me. And, you know, I say to myself, and sometimes if I'm in a position to, to say to them, I say to them, if the child has not called you, what is wrong in you calling the child? Communication is two-way. So don't wait for the child to call you called the child and these days uh, social media makes it so much easier. You, easier you can do FaceTime and not just the audio so um, communication is a two-way street communicate love communicate values communicate expectations don't just say I assume you should know better than that. Have you actually put it in the life of the child? Have you taught it from time to time? Have you taught your, your expectations so that the child does know? You see, teach appreciation as well. Teach understanding and teach forgiveness. And you must model these things. Let's talk quickly about peer pressure and influence. Now, this is uh, something that we all encounter. It's not just the adolescents, even adults encounter peer pressure. But what makes one stand at the end of the day is the values, the values. So we go back to values. And there's a saying that goes that if you don't stand for something, you will fall for anything. You will fall for anything. So one must be able to stand for something so that they don't just fall for anything. So that's about peer pressure. Uh, Overcoming peer pressure. And you know, once the values are so instilled, it is much easier to be able to say, no, I won't deal with drugs, I won't deal with, um, I won't deal with drugs, and I won't deal with, uh, you know, smoking or any other thing because of the values that I hold and I hold dear. So it's easier for them to be able to overcome peer pressure, you know, when they do have these values that they hold on to. Now, we get this question often, and people ask, when is the best time, at what age should I 
allow my child to date? And our answer, our response is to say, dating is something that should be taken very seriously. Taking, uh, dating should not be entered into uh, lightly. After all, dating is a conscious effort to spend time with a member of the opposite sex with a view to, having, um, to, to, to getting married. So a 14-year-old, for example, if you say, should my 14-year-old date? Then we ask you and we say, is your 14-year-old ready to marry? And if the answer is no, then you know what the answer is. So that's, uh, um, that's how we, we look at it from the school of parenting. So dating is not tied to a specific age, but to readiness and maturity for marriage. And I will emphasize, it should not be entered into lightly. Sex is another topic that we often shy away from. But sex is something we should educate our children about. And sex education should have started way before now, right from the time a child can identify body parts. Yes, that's the beginning of sex education. It should start from there, but it should certainly not stop there. And as they grow older, we put in just a little bit more education as um, age-appropriate education until we can actually talk to the children about sex. And you know, we tell them, save sex for marriage save sex for marriage and we help them with our own um, experiences or experiences of other people we'll give them guidelines of how to avoid sex uh, before marriage having said all of this we advocate that um, you know we should teach our children and let them know that we can make mistakes and we will accept them in spite of the mistakes so I'll end on this note of the of a story of a parent, you know, who had done all of this education to a child and then told the child, you know, now you are in the university. I know all I have taught you about um, sex and purity and all of that. But I do know that mistakes happen. And so what I want to tell you is I love you now and I will not love you any less if you make a mistake. If it so happens that you do make a mistake and you get pregnant, please bring the baby home. I and your mother will raise the baby and you can go back to school. So that's how I want us, how I want us to pass the message of love across to our children. So my beautiful sister will continue the, the our presentation until its conclusion. Thank you. Ake Ogumekong is a human resource practitioner, a certified professional counsellor, and a therapeutic coach. She also co-administers a charity that supports and creates opportunities for socially and economically disadvantaged families. She is on the faculty of the School of Parenting at Daystar Christian Center, Lagos, and she also serves in the Benevolence Ministry. Falake is passionate about parenting and is the author of two books, A Head Around Your Heritage and What My Children need to know before they leave home. She has two amazing young adults. Beyond um, faith and relationship, um, we're going to be talking about personal development and life skills, which are also, you know, key areas for our preteens and our teens. So, um, so let's talk about emotional intelligence. Um, a child who is in emotionally intelligent can understand and manage their own emotions. And that's pretty important for our parents to understand. And that's what intentional parenting is all about. Um, the different signs that your child can show that they um, either have high emotional intelligence or low emotional intelligence. Um, if you see that your child is aggressive, you know, your child is demanding or feel entitled, you know, your child is um, um, bossy or arrogant, those are signs of low emotional intelligence. If your child is warm, patient, um, your child listens, is charming, is um, you know, consistent and, um, you know, and um, assertive, those are signs of um, high emotional intelligence. And pretty much these children learn from us. You know, they learn from how uh, we relate with other people, 
the watcher the watchers, how we react, react to people, how we relate with our spouse, how we relate to our colleagues, our staff, actually our domestic staff. You know, they, they watch us. Do we respect other people? Are we nice to them? You know, so it's very, very important that, you know, we're aware that our children learn how to be emotionally intelligent from us. And how, first of all, we need to let them understand, you know, how to be aware of their emotions in the, the way they feel and when they feel angry let them know that they're angry and then how to react you know and relate to, with other people when it when when they feel that emotion and then showing empathy that's understanding how people feel and being able to relate to those you know to the other party based on their own feeling so emotional intelligence is, is being sensitive and empathic towards other people's emotions we need to teach our children you know about that and they and then they need to be able to express themselves effectively that's about communication really the earlier speaker has spoken a lot about communication we need to teach our children how to communicate effectively even um to their pairs their friends their family members and then managing stress is one other important thing children go to stress as much as adults go to stress so how are they managing the stress that they go through? First of all, they need to understand that this is stress and they need to understand how to um, be, be able to manage it effectively. You know, um, hanging out with friends, um, seeking support, talking to people that they trust. You know, that's one way they can manage stress. And then how to be able to resolve conflicts effectively. How do we as parents resolve a conflict? Do we scream? Do we, are we aggressive? You know, do we get um, angry easily? Those are the ways that children can learn how to manage conflict effectively. They have to be able to um, compromise, listen, and listen to other people's um, opinions and views, and then teach them to stay motivated and persistent in the face of setback. It's important for them to reflect on their actions, and that would help them to, um, to grow. Talking about setting boundaries is pretty much the process of establishing clear and consistent limits an expectation to help our children develop a sense of responsibility, autonomy, and held relationships. So boundary is not really about control. It's not about us parents controlling our children. It's about setting healthy um, limits for our children. And it helps to establish a foundation of trust and um, respect. How do we set boundaries? First of all, we need to um, have our children identify these boundaries recognizing our family values. Do we have family values? Do you have limits? So we need to carry our children along and then communicate these boundaries by using clear and assertive communication, actively listening to our children and validating emotions. Those are, that, those are part of um, communicating boundaries. And then we need to negotiate boundaries with our children. What does that mean? It means involving them in the, in the, in the in boundary setting process. So it's not about us saying, this is what you should do, this is what you should do. Let's carry them along. Let them be part of the process. You know, be, with that, we can achieve much success in this uh, process. And then we encourage compromise and be flexible. There are times we need to be flexible and not be um, uh, uh, and not, uh, not, not let the boundary be cast and so on, depending on, on, depending on the circumstances. So flexibility is key. And then we must not um, take for granted the need to enforce our boundaries. We have to establish consequences for boundary violations. So if a boundary has been set, it's been set by both parties, by us and our children, you know, we have to establish the consequences for those and enforce it. There should be consistency and follow through. Hmm. Most importantly is modeling these healthy boundaries. Being a role model for setting and respecting boundaries is very key for us parents and demonstrating self-care and respect. Our children also need to set boundaries of their own, you know, because they relate with their peers, they relate with, you know, other people outside the family. So, and they need a lot of our support. How do they get that support? By us engaging with them consistently. And so we need to encourage them to be self-aware, understand themselves, understand what they like, what they don't like, understand their temperament, their personalities. And so with this, we're able to set boundaries for themselves as well in relating with other people. And then, of course, we we'll continually provide guidance and support for this um, children so boundary setting is you know it's um, it's um, it's it's a way to empower children to develop self-confidence assertiveness and healthy relationship and with this uh, our children should be able to say no they have the right to say no without feeling um, guilty again decision making is another important thing decision making can be either good or bad you know it's a process where our children you know um, 
can understand the, um, the different choices they have to make and understand what, they happen, what happens as, result or as a result of those differences. And also it's about picking the best choices for themselves. What are bad decisions? What are good decisions? A bad decision can be keeping good friends. You know, the exact opposite is the bad one, keeping bad friends. Being respectful, being disrespectful. Being humble, being arrogant. So we need to you know, um, teach our children the importance of taking the right decision. How do we do that? First of all, we need to encourage your child to consider the different ideas before deciding. Let them be open-minded and then evaluate the good and the bad ideas of each option. Weigh the pros and cons for these children. Let them think about the consequences, you know, have they considered how their decisions will affect other people and themselves. That's very important. And then provide scenarios that they can, you know, that can help your child to develop skills to identify and solve issues, you know, are they, do they um, watch you solving issues, resolve, resolving conflict at home, or are your ch children busy you know, all the time playing um, games or, or the being on the phone? It's, it's as simple as you know, having them to go shopping or cooking or teaching them to put on the switch or you know, having them to pay bills. Those are ways for them to you know, learn how to solve problems. And then encourage them to uh, reflect on their past decisions so, so as to improve their future choices because they could have made you know um, bad decisions so encourage them to reflect on it so that it can help them to you know make bet better choices and then provide guidance while letting your child make his own decisions talking about life skills life skills is just about you know ab the abilities that children need to navigate the challenges of life and um succeed in life so it's a it's a part of life and we're we're, we're talking about first of all financial literacy what's financial literacy is the knowledge that children need, the knowledge and the skills that they need to make informed decisions about money, about budgeting, about saving, about investing, you know. And it's really important for us to carry our children along. And like, you know, like I said previously, they learn from us again. They learn from we parents. How, are we be, how have we been managing our finances? And what are the children seeing us do? Do they see us save? Do they see us budget? Do they see us invest? Do they ask us questions frequently about these things? You know, so it's very, very important. How do we start? You start by explaining the simple financial terms and concepts of money to our children. This would help them to understand money management. And then you lead by example. We've said that before. Show responsible financial behavior and discuss your own financial decision with your child. I remember when I was young and um, my, my, I, I, or noticed my dad would, you know, would have reduced my pocket money and he would tell me, ah, I'm sorry, I have to cut this a bit. How well can you manage this? Because I'm, I, I'm having to pay mortgage for a home. You know, I didn't quite understand it then, but I, 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 I thanked him for that when I became older because, I mean, he, he was able to get a house of his own. So that's a wise financial decision. Let's carry our children along. Involve them in budgeting. Let your child participate in creating a budget for their expenses, even their own expenses, not even yours, to learn the value of money and make informed decisions. They can even, you can even encourage them to, go, to do you know, vacation jobs and learn a little money, save that money and use that money to buy certain things. You know. Encourage saving habits, like, like we said. Have them, to open account, have them to open a savings account. Ideally, savings account should be opened you know, when, a ch when, the, when the child is um, younger than um, teenage years, but it's not too late if, if you're yet to open an account for your child. Open, open a savings account for your child and have your child be involved in that process. Now, there are a lot of you know, um, online tools and hubs that teach about you know, um, financial management that are age specific. You can go through that and teach your child about this. Teach them about income, teach them about expenses. Let them understand that their the expenses must always be lower than their income. It's on that basis that they can always have a profit or have s something to save, you know. And then discuss smarts, you know, spending with your child. Talk about making wise purchase, purchase decisions. Um, teach them about the the, um, the disadvantage of being extravagant, you know, um, distinguish between values, I mean, between wants and needs, the wants and needs, you know, needs are more important than wants. They take more priority than wants. And then they should consider long-term consequences before spending. Now, another area that we need to teach our child, our, our teens and preteens, is managing stress, being resilient. You know, um, really, Stress in teenagers can be caused by different things. First of all, at that age, they're going through some 
hormones in their lives you know that you know that help them to grow a lot of parents you know do not understand that when i started teenage, when i became a um, teenage um, parent i didn't quite understand when my child would go into mood swings you know and things like that and over time i've come to realize that at that age children go through you know, they, they they develop hormones that, that that can affect their moods and also cause them a lot of stress you know so stress management really for teenagers ability to effectively cope with challenges bounce back from setbacks and maintain emo emotional well-being you know other things can cause stress um school work uh, peer pressure assignments bullying exam all kinds of things even traffic you know commuting between home and school can cause um stress so we have to understand that and it's not, it's not only about us adults we need to appreciate this in our children and let them recognize that they are stressed when they're stressed and let them know how stress affects them and then it's important to also encourage a child to do things that they enjoy and they relax you know um for instance when they come back to school they don't have to go straight into doing their homeworks they can just you know have their lunch relax and then when they're settled they can do their homework that that will that would help them to manage stress better they can hang out with friends you know encourage their friends to come around and then they can you know do them you know do their hobbies play their hobbies and things like that also we need to teach our child to um you know to be able to handle stress in a healthy way um, one of it is being able to talk to somebody they trust and we should be the first person you know that a child should trust you know by engaging the child and listening to the child when the child is going through issues think positively remind your child to focus on the strength and be grateful and also the fact th the need for them to stay strong you know where when they when things are not going um good for them um let them understand that failure is a part of life failure is not um um, failure is just an event in the, you know, that didn't go through. So failure is part of success, is part of growth. It's important for you to, to let your child understand um, that. Taking responsibility is another thing. It's about being accountable for your child's action. It's about, being, it's, it's about the child being, you know, being accountable for his actions, being accountable for the choices and the obligations, and taking commitment seriously and working towards fulfilling this commitment. First of all, we should encourage a child to understand the importance of taking responsibility for their actions. It's about ownership, really. Teach them to solve problems, encourage them and equip them to solve challenges and find solutions to the problems um, that, they, uh, that come their way. It's also important to set guidelines and, and consequences for your child, you know, in, um, in, in, the, in the responsibility they're taking. Set clear expectations, teach them about time management skills you know it's important to prioritize tasks set goals manage their time effectively to fulfill their responsibility also um hold your child responsible for their commitment help them understand the impact of their choices they make they either make good choices or bad bad choices you know so help, help them understand the consequences of the choices they make provide guidance we're not supposed to control our child we're supposed to support our children in making decisions and learning from these mistakes and of course it's important for us to celebrate progress recognize and praise them you know when, when they behave um in a manner that is expected and this will motivate your child to continue taking responsibility so um We've said so much. We've explored in the importance of um, um, faith, relationship, personal development, and life skill in um, raising our preteens and our teens. You know, it's a journey that requires attention. You know, for the various aspects of of their lives. So, as parents, our, our role in nurturing, coaching, and encouraging our teens, our preteens, is of utmost importance. First of all, we need to invest time. We need to be patient, and we need to show love. And because this would help them to be responsible adults who are not only valuable assets to their families, but to the communities and, the and to, um, to the nation and the world at large. Um, the guidance that we provide our children during these formative years lay the foundation for their future success and fulfillment. And we must not forget that this journey, you know, parenting adolescents, parenting our teens apprentices is not without challenge, challenges. So we must be ready to um, face those challenges. But through open communication, trust, and unwavering support, we can inspire and empower our children to reach their full potential. Oh, welcome back, everyone. Um, thank you, Speaker Ronke. Thank you, Speaker uh, Falake. That was mind-blowing. 
really man, we have so many questions here. I hope we'll be able to um, attend to them all. But before we go into the questions, I'd like to um, encourage you all again, because we want to keep in touch with you. Please drop your contact through the registration link. If you go to the uh, chat room, you'll see the registration link sent there. We'd like to keep in touch with you. We also have a parenting platform where our parenting discussion goes on without refrain. Kindly join the parenting platform as well as on Telegram. Thank you, everyone. So right now, I'd like to welcome our panelists um, on board. Anyway, and actually, our speakers are panelists. So I'm going to welcome back um, Speaker Ronke and Speaker Falake back to the room because we'll have so many questions we'd like, like to ask you. So welcome, Sister Ronke, and welcome, Sister Falake. OK, so I have one here for Speaker Ronke. It says, you mentioned that age. Sorry, let me, let me get that very well. Yes, you mentioned that a 10 to 17 is an age for parents to coach and no longer instruct because it is assumed that the parents are giving instruction between age zero and nine. Now, now under faith, how does a parent who never really instructed the child in the way of the Lord when they were between age zero and nine, how would they begin to coach a child that is already in age 10 and above? Wow, thank you. Thank you so much. Let me rephrase that we will continue to instruct them. Uh, they will never grow you know, beyond our instructions. But assuming that we have been able to do a lot of teaching you know, between those first 10 years, then this is a time to cement, to buttress all those things we have learned. Of course, there are still things that we will continue to say are new. I give you an example. Now, um, your 12 year old comes with a problem, you know, from school. And she's wondering, um, how is she going to tackle the problem? You have been there before, you know, maybe a friend offended her and she has made up her mind. She doesn't want to talk to the friend or something, but you have been there before. It would be very easy to tell her that, you know, I'll quote the proverb and say, ah, if you are always remembering the offenses of yesterday, it will be difficult for you to have a friend. Yes, that is, you know, giving her an outright um, solution. But you can also coach by saying, oh, okay, so you decided not to talk to your friend again. Okay, so what if you need that friend's help um, tomorrow? What's going to happen? So, you know, you serve as a guide. You help them through the situation. You know, ask questions like, Oh, so what are you going to do about it? What do you think about it? Was it the right um, decision you made? Could you have done better? Let them walk through the process. You are there to guide. And then when they have finished making the cake, you can now top it up with the icing and cement their, um, how they have come through or show them loopholes. So it's not to say that we no longer instruct the children. That's far from it. But it's to say that unlike when they were two or three, I say sweep that room, clean that bucket, and um, you know, now you say, ah, this bucket is dirty. What do you think we should do about it? You know, so it's more of guiding them through rather than being the um instructor always that says, do this, don't do that. So I, I hope I've made myself a little bit clearer. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Coach. Um, I'll call you Coach. Coach Ronke. Okay? <laughs> okay, Coach. Let's go to Coach. I feel like now there's a question here. Parents says it's difficult to comprehend that children go through stress. I mean, they're not making money. <laughs> so the parent wants to know: Can you shed more light on this when you say parents go through stress? Uh, sorry, uh, children go through stress. I was going to say you mean children go through stress. We, we parents forget to, we forget that our children are also human beings like us. And just like we have emotions, our children also have um, emotions. And the, the different things that causes stress, that causes us parents and adult stress. And you'd be surprised to know that a lot of these things also cause our children stress. First of all, even the way we parents, you know, um, um, address stress in our life. Or do we pass it on to our children? There's, there's something called them. Um, there's something called transferred aggression. You know, so we come back from home 
because we've, uh, we've had, we haven't had a good time at work and we've gone through traffic and rather than calm down and, you know, just take a break, just take some breath and relax, you know, you probably got home and found, you know, your children throw their books around, or their shoes around and you start screaming and all of that. So it starts with us managing, you know, the, uh, managing stress in our life. And like I said, several things also cause stress in the life of our children. Even um, the fact that that they have to commute from home to work in a busy in a busy city, um, they have to deal with homework. Um, they're not there's not because children need rest. They need play. So so there's not enough time to rest. There's not enough time to play. It affects them in one in one way or the other. And then not to talk of um, the emotions they go through, especially the the young teenagers. You know they. Um, they're developing hormones that you know uh, that comes natu naturally um, in the process of their growth. So you know, we, we may not understand that. Like I said earlier, um, I remember when I became a first teenager, and I, di I didn't understand how why my daughter would be going into swings, and I thought she was being um, rude or she was just you know carrying out some attitude. And I was initially you know. Um, acting um, negatively towards until I now realize that she was actually going through some emotions, some hormones in her body and all that. And I became more emotionally intelligent with dealing with them. So we need to understand that bit and just and just calm down and um, engage with our children, talk, talk with them, be patient with them because they actually go through these things, you know. And sometimes it could be extreme. I remember when my son was, um, um, I think must have been about 18 then or so, and it was almost like it was going into depression. If I wasn't there, I probably wouldn't have noticed, you know. So certain things must have caused that. And then rather than, you know, you know, um, taking out on them, I said, why are you looking that way? Get up, do this, do this. You've, you've not done this. You've stayed in your room and all of that. They may be going through issues. So it's important that we engage with them, engage with them to find out what, act what actually they're going through. So all the things we go through in life, you know, um, economic issues, um, the fact that the, you know, the, the pocket money is actually being reduced because you're trying to manage your budget. All of those things can cause stress in our life. So it's important, you know, to constantly engage them, talk to them, be patient with them and um, understand, um, uh, understand what they're going through and understand that they're actually going through issues in their lives as well. And with that, that also creates a bond with when between you and your child, you know, and they feel um, the home is a safe place to actually um, to actually um, bear express themselves, mm -hmm. and that you also sensitive to their own feelings. I think I'll stop there for now. Thank you. Thank you, Coach Olaka. That was enlightening. I hope that helps the parent. Um, but you, can, okay, can I this one. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yes. Other sources of uh, stress for children could be changing an environment. You know, when parents move from um, one location to the other, whether it's in the country or outside of the country. Ah, did you pack all the kids for yourself? It's for you and your brothers, no? It can be a source of stress, you know, for the child. Hey, please, if you're not, uh, could you please uh, mute your microphone? Could you mute your microphone? Thank you, thank you very much. So we are all one family on this platform. You know, bullying at school is because it's <laughs> when a child is trying to improve their grades, you know, they are they are putting in so much work, even homework, when they have excessive homework, it's stress. And then when we parents don't control ourselves, we come back from work with all our you know, all the things we have gone through during the day and we don't remember to leave work at work and we bring work home. And then we, you know, we transmit all this to the children in not being our usual nice selves. And they don't know how even to shout, you know, the next minute, all those things constitute stress for the child. So yes, <laughs> children go through stress. So parents, I hope you've learned that children also go through stress and we need to manage our stress as well. Thank you for that, Coach Ronke. Um, there's actually another question here for you, Coach Ronke, so just hold on. Um, but before we go, please, if you're not talking, um, could you please mute your mic? We're having feedbacks from those who will mute their mic. Um, for us not to have much interferences, please mute your mic. Also, if you haven't um, dropped your registration link, uh, dropped your contact with us, kindly go to the chat room and click on the registration link so that we can have your contact with us. Okay, so back to Coach Ronke. It says, 
My 10 year old son was bullied in school. I have gone to his school to talk to his teachers about the situation and measures put in place for the offenders. My question, however, is how do I coach my son who is still, sorry, how do I coach my son to still maintain values of self-control, retaliating back, forgiveness? You know, you talked about values when you were talking. How do I now coach that, my son to maintain those values in the face of being bullied? That's a heavy one. And you know that applies to us um, adults as well. I would say that we continue to reinforce. Now, this is not the time to say, I have talked, you know, you, you know, you already know to forgive. We will encounter situations that are new, you know, not quite like the old ones. So bullying and, you know, somebody has caused you emotional hurts in the past is difficult to forget. But you can help the child and say, make a decision first of all to forgive. When you make a decision to forgive somebody, it doesn't mean that all the pent up feelings and emotions dissolve, they don't. But you will remind yourself that because of who you are and because of the values that you have, because you are a child of God and because you have been forgiven and because you also still continue to commit offenses that you have forgiven, you know, that you choose to forgive. So that has to be a choice. That's something we, 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 you will help the child to understand. The next thing is this. Um, let that child know that they are only responsible for themselves and not how somebody else behaves. You know, sometimes the temptation is to carry over and say, well, doesn't that person know better? No, the person doesn't know better. If they knew better, they would do better. So, you know, help the child to um, realize that the values in them are what is responsible for them forgiving, for them loving, for them choosing to be um, gentle despite all the things that they have faced. So that's another thing. And um, self-confidence, while we're saying all of these things, we also need to help that child to develop confidence. It's not the child's fault that the child was bullied, but we need to put in place measures that will improve the child's confidence and will improve the child's um, self-esteem so that the child does not be begin to cower and always think, uh, because I forgive, I, then I am a doormat. No, that's not the message we are passing across at all. So I hope the answer helps a little bit. Thank you. I think I would just like to share um, two experiences with my children with respect to bullying. Um, when my son was about, um, I think when he was 12, um, I noticed that he come, he's always a bubbly person, like the life of a party. I noticed when he came back from, he was quiet and, you know, looking withdrawn and all of that, you know, so the first thing is also to identify no when your child is going through certain things. If we're too busy, too engaged to notice, then it will just pass. And just like Dr. Ronkia said, it could affect their self-esteem, it could affect their self-confidence. So I, I walked up to him, I said, so what, what's the matter? How was school today? Um, what happened, you know, what happened today? I know that he wasn't talking like he's using it. So by the time, you know, I engaged with him and all of that, he was able to tell me that, you know, um, some of his classmates were, um, I bullied him, you know, maybe because he was answering, a lot of questions in class and they were just, you know, jeering and saying, are you the only one in class and kind of um, saying negative words to him and all of that. So I asked him, so how does that make him feel? I engaged him and he said, well, it, it feels very bad. It feels that he's not, he's not going to ever talk in class again and he's not going to talk to them again and all of that. So I engaged with him and helped him, you know, manage him, manage his emotions. And, you know, just like Dr. Roque said, you know, spoke to him about forgiveness and, and also the fact that, you know, um, he can control the way um, he responds to what anybody does to him, but he may not be able to control the other person's behavior. You know, and, and I asked him, I said, I feel I should talk to your teacher about it. First of all, resisted and all of that. I said, no, don't worry. You know, he's not gonna call, call you. I'm just gonna talk to me in confidence. You know, I'll, trust me, I'll manage it, you know. So I had to be sure that I, I, I did not betray his trust. So I, I picked up the phone and spoke to his teacher and said this and this and this is what has happened and this is what is, you know. So the, the teacher assured me that I shouldn't worry that he's going to deal with it and I, I should trust him. And we left it at that. And um, the next day he came up, came back home, you know, in his usual self, bubbly and lively. I said, so I was supposed to, they said, ah, mommy, you know that my friends came to me, they were laughing, were gisting, and they were even 
commending me for the things I did yesterday. I said, mom, I gave him a high five, you know, and he said, mom, thank you, you know. So, so that's one experience. The other, the other experience was when my, um, when it was starting um, A level and in a different school and a different environment, just like Dr. Ronke had said initially. And, um, you know, um, his classmates started bullying him, calling him names and all of that. And, and usually I teach my children that you may experience this in life and you must be able to stand up for yourself, you know, and that's where, that's where self-confidence come, come from. You don't have to be aggressive. You don't have to be abusive, but you know, stand up for yourself. And, you know, he, he, he came home one day and get, was angry. I said, these boys don't, you know, they, you know they, um, they think I'm a fool. They just keep saying things and all of that because I'm a new, I'm new in the class. And um, I just said, just stand up for yourself. Remember to stand up for yourself, you know, um, in a gentle manner. So um, he came back home one day and said, I said, I did it. I did it. I said, so what did you do? He said, well, I just, um, one guy came and, you know, pushed my head and I just held his hand and I, and I told him, don't ever do that again. Don't <laughs> ever, ever in your life do that again. And apparently nobody has ever, you know, spoken to that boy like that. And everybody in this class were Jerry, you know, laddy, laddy and all of that. And anyway, so that was how the bullying ended. And he ended up being the head boy in that school. You know, so, so sometimes you need to be able to face up to bullies for them to withdraw and, and um, let you be. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Hold on, Coach Runke, because I have another question here for you. <laughs> Sorry, Coach Apolake. Okay, so um, this question says, how can the parents strike a balance between giving their adolescents independence and setting appropriate boundaries? You know, you talked about boundaries, setting boundaries, um, involving them whilst, while setting the boundaries and then consequences and all that. So this question is, this parent wants to know how can the parents strike a balance between giving the adolescents independence and setting appropriate boundaries? Okay, so I believe that um, most of us, if not all of us in this room are parents of adolescents or teenagers. And we know that, you know, when they, when they, when they reach that stage in life, they want to show that they're free, you know, they, well, they want to show that they're independent, independence and, you know, they want to show that they know and they kind of sometimes resisting, you know, the things that we tell them. And, you know, that if we do not understand how to manage them, that can get us really upset and angry. And we think they're rude. We think they're, they're ill-mannered. And you start to wonder, how, where did I get wrong as a parent? You know, so <laughs> like they say, that teenage years is, um, is, is the most difficult um, period of managing uh, for parents to ma manage their children. But really, if you, if you understand how this works, then it will be, a, you know, it will be a smooth, it will be a, be a smooth ride for us. So, so as a group, we should also, uh, we should understand, you know, this bit about them that they want to um, be able to express themselves. They want to be able to be heard, you know. So, they they maturing is the process of being is the process of maturing, and we all want children to grow anyway. So, it's a it's a growth process for them, you know. So, and then you will begin to. Um, make them more um, resp responsible, you know, gradually, um, give them ind independence, gradually involve them in decision makings in the house, gradually, um, you know, you want to plan an outing, you know, let them plan it. Um, at some, I remember at some, at some point, my, my daughter would want to, you know, choose a dress. So maybe I just realized that, you know, all the dresses or shoes I bought for her for months, she's not even touched it. I'm like, what's wrong with you? You know, I spent so much money and um, buying all these things and you're not wearing it. And she said, I don't like it. I don't like it. <laughs> you know, so at that point, you, you need to like retreat a bit and okay, what do you like? As long as it meets, you know, your values, you know, as long as it meets your values and it, and it looks nice. So begin to release that autonomy, that freedom, that independence, you know, gradually. Like I said, involve them in decision making in the house, you know, and um, you're, you're drawing up a timetable for menu, involve them in that decision. You know, you're you're planning an out. Where do we want to go? Where do we want to go? You know, if if if, if let, let's try not to impose our will on our children. At, on our, because at this time they they're discovering themselves. They're becoming more, more aware of themselves. So when we do, when we try to impose ourselves on our children in the teenage year or the adolescent adolescence year, you know, where where it's good, it, it may affect their self esteem. It may affect their affect their self-confidence, it may affect their decision-making. Making, making So in the process or in that teenager, they're building a lot of skills. 
you know, taking responsibility, um, managing the emotions, dealing with other people. If you react negatively by shouting or screaming or uh, like some children will say, oh, mom, you're taking me on a, on a guilt trip, you know, <laughs> you know, and all that. So you, if, if all of those things can affect the way they relate with other people in the outside world, they learn relationship management, like Dr. Ronkia said earlier, from the home. And, and usually it's during this period because in their earlier years, you know, they used to say, mommy said this, daddy said this, and they would listen to mommy. If they, if they, if they don't listen, you know, you, you, would, uh, you probably you discipline them and all of that. But at this time, they're discovering themselves. So allow them to be. Sometimes you may need to even negotiate, you know, you, you know, hear them out. This is, they say, no, they're insisting, no, it should be this way. And you say it should be this way. Sit down and look at it. Okay, will it work? Will it not work? Okay, let's try yours. That can even fail. So if that's fail, that's not the time to say, I told you, you should have listened to me. And no, failure is part of growth. And you're teaching them a lesson as well that failure is part of growth. You fail, you pick up from, you pick it up from where you, from, it's, it's another, um, it's another way of learning to do it better. You know, how many of us parents have not failed in life? We all have failed in life and that's not even the end of fa failure. We can also fail, you know, um, in future. So let's not think that failure is something bad and start to castigate our children, you know, because of that. So engage them um, um, often, have an open communication. Engage them all the time, talk to them, you know. So time is key. Time is a major currency in parenting, you know. And it doesn't, it doesn't, have, it doesn't have to be physical. You know, my children are not here. We talk every day. Thank God for social media. Thank God for... Um, video calls and all of that but time you have to create that time find out what's going on in their life talk to them engage them you know and listen to them actively listen listen to them it's not about imposing our will to them it's not about controlling them but with that they would even appreciate that better and they also learn how to manage you know other people um in their uh, other people um that they really relate with outside their outside their home and then um and then you can even discuss things like maybe um, okay, you're allowed, your 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 daughter wants to go go out on um, uh, with her friends, you know, and um, and you can say okay, go out at this time and come back at a particular time. Negotiate the time. Uh, even that is too is too early. Okay, you can come back at five, come back at six, but if you come back later, there'll be consequences for for that. And even if if they have to come back late, maybe because of traffic and all of that, you know, encourage your child to even um, um, communicate this to you. I'm running late, mom, because of traffic. I'm, uh, I'm you know, I, I understand I should have gotten back home at five o'clock, but sorry, I'm running, I'm running late and all that. So it's also part of engaging and talking to your children about these things. I remember there was a time my daughter was going to go on a, on a trip with her friends after her school, and she was going to travel, you know, outside the, outside the city. And I didn't want to go. I didn't want her to go. I'm like, ah. She's, um, she was just maybe 17 or 18. How can I allow this girl to travel outside the city with her friends? You know, but I thought about it. I said, this is an, an opportunity for her to build trust, you know, in, in so I said, okay, go. I, I go, I'll, I'll talk to your friend's parents. I got a number, I got a friend's um, um, uh, parents' number, a friend's number as well. And once in a while, I'll check in on them. I wasn't checking on them very often, but once in a while, I'll check in on them to find out how they're doing and all of that. And she went on that trip and came back and that singular event has, you know, brought so much closeness to, I believe it's, 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 it's what made um, my daughter and my relationship to be stronger because there's hardly anything she cannot tell me about, you know. So sometimes we need to allow that to build, you know, trust in our, in, in, in our children and it creates a, a form of balance, you know. And when they miss it, let them know that they miss it and, um, and, um, you know the 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 way the ways you can deal with that in, in terms of discipline, in terms of talking to them, and you know, um, telling letting them know the consequences of what they've done to their own, um, to themselves, and to other people. Um, I, I think I'll stop at that. Thank you. Thank you, Coach Falake. Thank you very much. But I, I hear you say one of the things I had I've learned here is that um, when we are assigned them these responsibilities, or we let them take um. Um, um, responsibilities and make them face the consequences. It helps communication. That's one. And then you said something. When you said you talked about the trip uh, that you allowed your daughter to go through, how it eventually built some form of relationship between both of you because it builds trust. 
So I think I, I, I believe that I'll be able to do that now with my kids because my kids are actually in this range as well. Thank you very much. There's another question here from a very concerned parent and I'd like to read it out. It says, parenting is first of all about house parents. No, 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 this is not it. This, this, there's another question. It says, my son is currently 12 years old, loves computer and technology so much and doesn't mind spending uh, 24 hours in front of the laptop. All my attempts to help him control it usually make him feel I'm denying him something that he really likes. Even though I have Googled, Googled up some of the effects of heavy exposure, exposure to computer screens and radiation, I have tried to give him, I've also tried to give him time schedule for using his laptop, but it is a hard task trying to give him, trying to get him stick to it. How do I not overdo this, please? I really want him to have a balanced life by God's grace. Do you want to take a, a, a go at that quote for like I have a quote okay. It goes to any of you. Okay, I can start off. Um, you know, we, we, there's no question that we will take that will not revolve around communication. There is hardly any question. And so I think this one is one that borders on communication. The child needs to understand the concerns of the parents. You know, many times parents are concerned for the children, but rather than pass this concern over to them, um, pass a concern of, wow, you know, I do know that screen time, if when you spend so much time looking at screens, it has an effect on your health you may have a headache you may have you may strain your eyes to the extent that you start having eye aches in fact being in a sitting position for so long can affect your posture in later in now in the present and in later years those are objective things that we can communicate but many times we we make the mistake of not itemizing our concerns and just taking a decision for them and saying don't do this and so they take it the wrong way. We understand our concerns, but they don't. So we have not, we often don't communicate exactly what we mean, and we must learn to do so. I don't want you to spend so much time on the screen because it's going to deprive you of other things. Yes, I appreciate that you enjoy the computer and who knows, you may be the next Bill Gates um, of tomorrow. I will encourage you. In fact, I will be your first chairman. However, you need to balance these things. Before you can become the Bill Gates, you need to also be sound at school work. And so we need to create time for your mathematics, for your English, for your the other subjects, you name them. So the child comes to an understanding that yes, you are their cheerleader, you are their champion, you want them to be well balanced, you want them to be well rounded. So the first place is that. Uh, from his communication and then when that communication is established you can now have a schedule that you will both agree on I think yes you can have a, you can draw up a schedule for them but draw them in let it be that the child and the parent agree on the schedule and when you now agree on the schedule it doesn't mean that you leave them their children <laughs> they are children so they still need to be supervised uh, they still need to be monitored just to make sure that the agreement is being, and you know, as um, like I said earlier, if there is a derailment, we need to agree on the consequences, uh, you know, for the derailment. This place, it will help that Somebody needs to mute their microphone. They are disturbing our understanding. Thank you, Coach Ronke. Um, okay, I have a good question. Let me add that around. I think because, because of time, we may have to just, I don't know, I'll see how we can muzzle it together. There's a question that has to do with sex education and all that. The first one says, I was informed by my children's school that they are under obligation to teach my 11 year old sexual relationships and how to make babies. He is just in year six. I have taught him age appropriate sex education long before now. Now this, that the school is going to teach them actual sex, how do I teach him at home before the school does? Let me take the second one so we can, the other one says, my son is 12, 
and he feels more comfortable relating <laughs> with girls than boys. I asked him why. He said boys are usually too aggressive and they play rough. I am really worried about it. How do we help this parent? Don't you okay? Okay, let me, let me take the first one and then Estefolake will take the second part. We'll try and be, we'll try and manage time. Okay, so for the sex education, I think 11, by 11, a child should actually know a great deal about sex. Okay, let me come from the perspective of um, um, secondary sexual characteristics, you know, the deepening voice, the, what do you call it, the, the breast enlargement, the menarche, the, the ejaculation, the early morning thing, you know, that we call wet dreams. By now, these children, many of them encounter it early. So the things that don't come from us, don't make a mistake in thinking that because education did not come from you, your children are not educated. They know some things that even you as a parent will be shocked. So my approach to that 11 year old would be to say, well, as 11, some girls have started menstruating. And by now, if the child has not even started, the child should know to be ready. So if a child is ready, you know, old enough to know about menstruation, then that child should be old enough also to know about sex. So let the sex education, let the, I know you've started it, but let the completion, let it come first from you, okay? So tell them about sexual relationships between uh, the male and female. Tell them how babies are made. Let it come from you. Once you have told them the truth as you know it, it has come from you. And then the, the school can go ahead and you know, finish that education. But then don't just leave the school. When the child comes back, the child will be freer to talk to you. But you must ask, what did you learn in school? And then because you have laid it an excellent foundation, the child is freer to talk to you about it. And whatever, was learned at school that you don't like, you can quickly intervene and step in and say, hey, this part of it is true. However, you know, and then you begin to mold it that way. Thank you. Very much. Okay, I'll just say think, that the second well, question right. has to do with, the question question has to do with um, um, the child um, uh, relating more with the girl than the boy. So you yes. just correct balance, you know, and also let them know that in life, in future, they'll be relating with both genders. So in relating with boys and girls will be able to help them to understand the person of a man or the person of a woman or the person of a girl or the person of a, of a boy. And then, of course, you tell the child to look out for boys that are less aggressive. God has been faithful to us. He has, uh, he has taught us again today. And we trust him that everything we learned today, we are going to make use of them and we're going to have better homes, children that are growing in the way of the Lord. You are here and um, you want to renew your relationship with the Lord or you want to start afresh with the Lord. You want to give your life to Christ. I want you to just go ahead and, and speak to God. Heavenly Father, we lift up our brethren into your mighty hand. But thank you, Father, for a time like this. We appreciate you for their lives. We thank you because you brought them here for a, for a purpose. And we thank you because you are accomplishing that purpose. The exalted Lord in Jesus' name. Mighty Father, we ask for forgiveness of sins. We decree today, Lord, that even as they speak to you, Lord, you will accept them into your fold. You will accept them back into the kingdom in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. The grace they need even to walk in your path as parents, you will grant unto them in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Father, we thank you because their sins are forgiven. But thank you, Lord, because their names are written in the book of life. Be exalted, Lord, in Jesus' name. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. Father, we want to thank you for every one of us that took part of this program. We thank you for our speakers. We thank you, Lord, for all the participants too. Lord, for everything we've learned today, we ask for grace to be doer of your word in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Lord, we decree as many families as are represented here today, none of us will be lacking in bringing up our children in the mighty name of Jesus. We will not be lacking in bringing up our children in the ways of the Lord in Jesus' name. The Holy Spirit will help us. The Holy Spirit will guide us to do the right thing, to bring them up in your ways in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. Praise the Lord. 
And with that, we are coming to the end of the program. And we look forward to next time when we come together again. As we go, we go in the name of the Lord. The Holy Spirit helps us. Despite everything happening in our environment, we will come out shining. We will stand out for the Lord. Our children will stand out for the Lord in the name of Jesus Christ. Thank you so much for joining us. And do have a great time, even as you continue to bring up your children intentionally in the way of the Lord. So thank you. Bye-bye.